Our first speaker this morning is Brother Joseph Palmer from the San Diego County, California Ecclesia. The theme for Brother Joseph's classes this week is what has the Lord Jesus Christ got to do with me? Today's class is entitled Salvation Principles. Brother Joseph. If anyone can remember all the way back to yesterday, <laughs> then we went through together some of the principles that God has established as his means by which we are saved. And I made a few excuses for looking at means and principles to some extent because it sounds mechanistic. And all of these things that we're looking at are expressions of God's character and his grace. So it's not like we've arrived at the sum which equals salvation. And as we observe these things, I've put them into tables, not because that's what God's given us, just because it helps me to understand a little bit of what's going on. If anyone went through baptism and used the Christadelphian Scripture Study Service book, Preparing for Baptism, there's, I like how short it is, <laughs> firstly. And I remember going through that when I was 15, 16, and just really enjoying uh, a component of it, which is what a large part of this next class is based on. So we built up some of the principles of this yesterday, and it's not, it's not like I, you know, God gives us this and all the check boxes marry up and we're all good to go. And this, you know, could go on and on and on because it's not like we're limited to just a few different things. But for those of us who went through that preparing for baptism booklet, there was something smaller than this that essentially had an angel at the last but one, the penultimate line there. Uh, and, uh, and it wasn't quite as big of a thing as this, but it's based on that, so that's the derivation of it. And I wanted to, to go through some of that today. And this was, and, and there is a correct way of filling, no, there's, there's no perfect way of filling this in. It doesn't like, marry up to absolute essence of anything, but if you'd like to, and this is kind of more for the teens, but if you'd like to, you can go through and figure out how you think these things work out in terms of, is it, do you agree with me that uh, the fig leaves didn't show truth? They failed in that regard. Did they fail to show mercy? And did they fail to show blood? So those truth, mercy, and blood elements are things that God requires of the sacrifice. We'd looked at the covering, and Adam and Eve recognized that they needed covering. A large portion of the world recognizes there's, there's a problem, there's a hole in their life. And they try, and we try to cover that, that problem in different ways. Some people turn to alcohol and drugs as a way of doing that, or music, or art, or different things to try and address this longing in us for something, some meaning, some purpose in life throw ourselves into our work or whatever it may be. Uh, and a lot of people turn to religion for that. And the, the means which God has chosen, one of those things was that the covering had to have a shedding of blood element. And it also had to establish his mercy and his truth. Now, I've approximated God's entire character down to those things, which is likely unfair. But he does also use those two words, mercy and truth, to do the same. Remember yesterday we looked at the essence of his character being that the core of it was truth and coupled around it was the mercy. And in Psalm 85 verse 10, he said, mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed one another. And the challenge for us is that we probably are weighted one way or the other, personally, individually, family, collegially, Bible school -ly. There's different ways in which we're weighted uh, on the spectrum of mercy and truth, these opposing forces. And it's difficult because we want to show in our behavior our acknowledgement of those two principles. And when it comes down to truth, we need to show that we're separate. We need to, to be a separate, we're called to be a separate people, a holy people. And we've got to try and do that without being aloof, which is tough, isn't it? Because if you show yourself a separate, then people will say, well, look at you, who do you think you are? And if you show mercy, then the, the risk is that people will think you're part of the world. 
And so we all, every day, we struggle with this idea of how do we put into practice the balance of life uh, which demonstrates an understanding of mercy and truth. And, of course, we have to look to the Lord Jesus to do that, who perfectly balanced that at every time and try and mirror as much as we can what's going on. The unique understanding the brotherhood has of the work of the Lord Jesus with the Father is that we have a representative sacrifice, that the offerer is part of the sacrifice. Galatians 2.20, we keep going back to, what does the Lord Jesus have to do with me? I am co-crucified with Christ. So you are part of the offering. And it wasn't like all of a sudden we come to the New Testament and God thinks or demonstrates, hey, you know what, we'll have, this one will be a representative one. We've never done that before. But we, what we hope to trace this morning together is that there were actually elements of that representative sacrifice that were indicated all along. Unacceptable fig leaf worship based on blame and, and shame, which tends towards murder, is a natural way of covering. And natural isn't usually good, is it? It's by nature that we fight. It's by nature that we, we lie. These are natural things and based on the senses, their serpentine thinking, the devil and Satan. That's based on the senses. So this is an unacceptable worship. And there's helpful descriptors that are in our speech that will help us to understand where we stand on atonement, on the work of the Lord Jesus. Our behavior will demonstrate our understanding of our God. Helpful descriptors wouldn't really have anything to do with these fig leaves. They covered me, and I'm good to go. But when you look at Galatians 2.20, if you have your little handout thing, there's the word with which is helpful. In me is helpful. And there's words like that come up in the pattern of our speech. With is helpful. Participation is helpful. Hid in. Colossians Colossians talks about that. Put on. These are helpful. Uh, For, on behalf of identification with, included in, partakers of. This is language which is a good and helpful way of understanding the work of the Lord Jesus. And it can crop up in our speech. And when we hopefully will have a look later on at a few examples of this, think of people in the Bible and how they speak and whether they are integrating a whole or speaking of themselves. Poor descriptors include instead of, substitute, it should be, but it's not. These are I, me, my, myself, personally. These are things that typically are unhelpful at understanding the offering that we bring. We, particularly. The brotherhood, how do we speak of it? You will hear yourself and others say, those Christadelphians, or they do this. Well, it's an indicator of what's going on in your mind. I was talking to somebody, it was a brother Tom, I think, about uh, pronouns and different things, like what that is. We never did them in school. I don't know about you, but in the 70s and 80s in Britain, they decided we didn't need to load them up with all this grammar nonsense. And so they didn't, and I never, I still struggle to understand what a noun is, I've got to be honest, I really do. <laughs> I don't know what a verb is, and then when we get beyond that to adverbs, I'm, <laughs> I'm out of here. But I've understood recently that I and me and those ones are called pronouns. So those pronouns are an indicator of where we stand. So if we talk about those Christadelphians, they do this, the brotherhood does the other, we find that we may be going towards the unhelpful understanding of the work of Jesus. Whereas when we say we and our and us, we start including ourselves in that. So think perhaps in your life about your pronouns and whether they are helpful to be an inclusive thing or whether you're using pronoun. Pronouns are like an in thing right now, right? <laughs> but 
think about them in terms of your inclusivity within the brotherhood and with Christ, our, us. These are helpful. And in the English, not necessarily in the Bible, the, the most helpful phrase the brotherhood understands, the work of the Lord Jesus, is the representative work of the Lord Jesus. And when we think of other ways of viewing it, they, they have value too. There's even the extreme ones, like a substitutionary sacrifice. There's an element of truth to that, just like the serpent had an element of truth to saying, you shall not surely die, that was wrong. But then he said, you'll be like the angels, knowing between good and evil, that was right. There's, there's a mixture of truth. Even a substitutionary understanding of the atonement has an element of truth, but it's not very helpful uh, the element of truth is that it was the Lord on the cross and not me. So there's an element of truth to that, and we, we do value the fact that it was, it was the Lord and not us on the cross. But it's unhelpful because instead of means you separate Jesus, our Lord, from his flock. He did it instead of me. Whereas the words of Scripture always place Jesus with the flock. He is the good shepherd who leads He's not the beating shepherd from the back sending people around the place. And so the helpful language that we have with the brotherhood is, I am co-crucified, I am crucified with Christ. In addition to having to have a sacrifice, the Lord, we later find out, and we perhaps assume that maybe in Eden it was the same, he doesn't just require any old sacrifice. May, it's hard for me to believe that a dead deer that happened to be in the garden was the skin that was used. It's, and maybe it died of some disease and Adam and Eve were wearing like blotched and like problematic dripping things on them. It's far more likely that it was an unblemished animal, isn't it? That it was, a, well, you couldn't bring your sick typically. There, was, there were some occasions, weren't they, under the law where you're allowed to bring something that was slightly less than perfect, which are fascinating. But generally, Leviticus 1, 3, 3, 1, without blemish is the phrase that the scriptures use. And when we look at the salvation principles, we want to make sure that when we look to see if something fits, we want to make sure that all the principles of God are in there. And we just approximate them down to mercy and truth. But there's others. It had to, by 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the work of the Lord had to establish the power of God and the wisdom of God. It had to show his righteousness, it had to show his love. How can you take that off the sheet? Well, we can't put everything on there. So what you'll find is on your handout that perhaps the meeting point between truth and mercy, if you like, is, is where righteousness sits. Although oftentimes righteousness is a short form for truth, or I guess a long form for truth. And we have to remember when we go through this that all of it requires forgiveness. It's not mechanical. And it requires an amazing amount of grace. So the fig leaf covered, okay? So you could say it atoned because an atonement is a covering, but it was unacceptable. It didn't establish truth. It didn't establish mercy. There was no blood shed. And we can argue these were the most perfect fig leaves ever made <laughs> to date. But I don't look like a fig leaf, and some of you do. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's not very representative, is it? So what we have to ask ourselves is, is our understanding of the work of the Lord getting in the way of our behavior for the Lord? We, we have weak enough as it is, so let's have a, a clarity on the, the danger of relying on senses and the salvation being to glorify God's character through the good understanding. So... If you like, go through these and, and check out what you think is, is the, the best way of depicting whether these things satisfy those elements of God's way of saving. The next one on the line is the coats of skin. And the coats of skin differ from the fig leaves in that they are God-instituted sacrifices. So there is a distinct difference between, between what man-made religion looks like and what God's looks like. So I don't know if you've done your check boxes. I'll, I'll be marking them afterwards and there's an exam if you want dinner. But I've given them a little check mark for mercy and a little one for truth. Um, it established that God was right, that sin needed to be covered. So you could give a little check mark for perhaps for truth. Uh, that God was willing to forgive. 
so you could give a little check mark for mercy. The mercy was somewhat limited though, wasn't it? It wasn't like this happened and now you can continue to live forever. The consequence of sin, had that been removed? No, they still died. So this was an atonement that had a limit to it. Perhaps though, they were allowed to live on through this sacrifice. The day that you take of this food, you, you will die. Well, we often would look at that as like, you'll start to die. But perhaps this covering meant that they could continue to live for a number of years longer, but not forever. So there's a limit to those mercy that's involved in this. Uh, but the big problem, of course, well, we'll assume that it was, well, we, blood must have been involved if it was an animal sacrificed. Uh, we assume it was unblemished. So there's presumption there. So maybe there should be little check boxes as well because there's an assumption. But the big problem with animal sacrifice is that I don't bleat. I don't moo. I don't look like them. I don't sound like them. They don't represent me very well, as perfect as they may be. And in fact, by being perfect, they don't represent me very well. <laughs> but there was a shadowy way in which this was going to give us, almost like if you're an artist, you think of the initial sketch that may be put around what this is going to look like at the end with the Lord Jesus. The initial sketch is kind of shady, but a shadowy representation of what will be an acceptable sacrifice is that they, what did they do with the skins? They wore them. And so it approximates a representative sacrifice in a little tiny way, a little sliver, a little chink. And that helps us to understand that the offerer is part of the offering. The next human attempt on your page is the fruit and veg version. And this is coming from the wisdom which is beneath. This is based on senses. Now, you would say that true religion had already been established by this coat of skins. And I'm sure that the angels were able to express more about true worship and religion to, to the early people on the planet. But this is an attempt, much like the wearing of fig leaves, to say, okay, well, I guess fig leaves are unacceptable, but I don't, I mean, I don't want to have to go get a lamb. I mean, I raised the most beautiful, look at my beetroot, it's lovely, whatever it was, fruit and veg of some type, Genesis 4, verse 3 through 5. Does the offering of fruit and veg help us out? Does it establish truth and righteousness and uh, does it establish mercy? Is there shedding of blood? Is it representative? We'll assume these are the most perfect fruits and vegetables ever made. That courgette was just perfect. But we'll assume it was unblemished. So it doesn't. Uh, and the interesting thing is the behavior of the offerer with a poor understanding of atonement comes out later. So just like the thought process that started with senses led to murder, and used fig leaf religion to sort of cover things up. So with Cain, the expression of his behavior based on his understanding of atonement leads to murder too. So fig leaves had blame and shame. Human worship tends towards that murder. It's an extreme thing, isn't it? But that's what happened with Jesus. And in John, when you look through there, he's like, they're like, what are you talking about? People are trying to murder you. Are you crazy? But it was. That's where their natural senses took them, to violence. Your father was a murderer from the beginning, Jesus had said. We looked at that in John. And you look at people like Jezebel and Balaam. It led to death, that mindset, that evil religion that looks okay. And it comes from processing thoughts carnally. And yet the way of processing thoughts in a godly way tends to life and that more abundantly. Cain's sacrifice, if we think about it leading to murder as an expression of his understanding, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, we may think, okay, well, I'm struggling to think that my understanding of atonement is going to lead to me trying to stab this brother or sister. It doesn't really go there. But Matthew 5, Jesus makes it a little bit more difficult, doesn't he? Matthew 5 doesn't say... Well, he does say, don't, don't kill your brother. But you have heard that it was said, Matthew 5, 21, 22, you've heard it was said by them of old time, you shall not kill. 
and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And so our, when we take our eyes off the true sacrifice of the Lord, then we could go down the path of anger, malice. None of us have ever been angry with our brothers and sisters. I understand that. We can go down that path. Now, we've observed it in others. And you could say, well, technically it says without a cause. Right? So I'm only angry with my brother and sister with a very good cause. And you're totally right, and that's fine. <laughs> so there's a huge element of exhortation there, isn't there? That we have to examine ourselves. Jesus does say oh, through the gospel, through the epistle, be angry and sin not. Hands up if you can do that. Uh, it is given to us as, like, God is angry. Jesus looks round about in Mark, says he looked round about upon them with anger. So there is a time and a place for it. But who can separate between anger and sinning not? I mean, <laughs> the Lord? Uh, oh, that's it. So we have to look at ourselves and think, when I'm angry with my brother and sister, am I expressing the mercy and truth of God? I may be angry for a very just reason. And yet there's a huge danger, isn't there, within that? So how about some more of the uh, sacrifices? Let's have a look uh, at the animal sacrifice. So again, this one was instituted by God, uh, or at least initially it was, and Abel's sacrifice was acceptable. Hebrews talks about that as being by faith. So there must have been something about this which was a bit more special than on face value. We won't need to go into that, but Abel's offering was similar to the skins in the garden and offered the offerings under the law. Were the offerings acceptable? Were they effectual? Well, they portray parts of the Father's characteristics and they foreshadow the Lord Jesus. Were they forgiven based on these offerings? Because it's not representative. And this is an interesting thought that the offering of Abel, despite it preying thousands of years before the Lord, it was effectual. And how is that? It's an interesting thought to think of the work of the Lord Jesus the, the load that he carried on his shoulders. He's regarded in uh, Revelation 13 as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So even though he was slain around 30 AD, the retrospective effectualness of his sacrifice is an interesting concept, that his work with the Lord actually had a reverse effect too. So all those who'd worshipped God and acceptably uh, sacrificed to him before those were affected by his actions, as well as us. So he had a work that went both ways. And that's, that's lovely to think that the father accepted, well, on the face of it, you could say, well, it was unacceptable worship, but he accepted it based on what would happen in thousands of years' time, which demonstrates that it wasn't the physical things themselves, because they didn't have the blood of Christ then. It was what it was portending to. That's the interest thing. Right, I wanted to think about the Day of Atonement here because just like the putting on of the skins, there's some interesting aspects to that which give a little indication. So if you like, if you're doing your sketch from Genesis chapter 3 and seeing how God operates, they put the skins on, so that's a little bit like, but not very much like, what Jesus did. When it comes to the animal sacrifices, what happened to them? What did they have to do to the animal to make it a little bit like a representative sacrifice? They had to put their hands on that animal, didn't they? Has anyone killed animals? I mean, not like going around. Do we have any hunters in here? I'm sure we have some. No, no hunters? Oh, we have one or two. Anybody farmers? Yeah, kill, kill a few chickens or things? It's, no, it's not fun. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal, perhaps, but I mean, I, I, when, I, when I was training, so in environmental health in Wales, you have to do so many hours of training in meat inspection. So you have to go to the slaughterhouse, and you had to be part of the slaughterhouse team. Uh, so I don't know why we do it to this extreme, but so that you can go to the supermarket and say, that's meat. You had to go, and, <laughs> and, and, and I know it's meat because I went to the slaughterhouse. <laughs> I don't quite follow it, but anyway. So you, you see the chain of where it's coming from. And these, oh man, there's some beautiful little calves would come in. Those jerseys, that was so pretty. Big 
brown eyes. Anyway, I won't go into that. I'll start crying. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, I, being uh, uh, 19 or whatever, 20 when I was in there, the slaughtermen, who are renowned for their sweetness and tenderness, suggested that I might want to kill one of the, the sheep as well so I could do it with them. So I did take the knife and kill that sheep. It was, like a, it was a lamb, but it was like 100 pounds. So. And it didn't feel good. And I felt like I just took the life of this animal. It did taste really good later, but at, at the time, it, it, it was like, oh, that's, there's a finality to that. It's not, it's not fun. It wasn't, I mean, if you do it all the time, it probably inures you to it. But it's not fun, and it definitely sort of hit me afterwards. And especially the pigs, they're so clever. They know what's coming. And uh, yeah, they, they scream like babies when they saw you come in, the pigs. So uh, yeah, I've been scarred for life from that. Um, <laughs> but what, hopefully, by putting your hands on this animal, by watching its death, you would see the severity of sin, where it leads to. What do you get from the Day of Atonement goats? It's the same sort of check boxes that you could give for that. But why were there two? What's in it, what is it an approximation of? Leviticus 3, verse 2, verse 8, and verse 13 says, you are to lay your hands on its head. Which goat did you lay your hands on? The one to be slain. Is that right? Well, have a look. Let's have a look. Leviticus chapter 3. It's not, he's not wrong, but there's more to it. Leviticus 3. Verse 2. He shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it. Right? So there's, there was a goat that was killed, um, or an animal that was killed here, that would, which you put your hands on the head of. Um, verse 8, he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it. Um, verse 13, he shall lay his hand upon the head of it and kill it. Now, there was also the goat that was the approximation to resurrection, too. So there's two goats. Now, God's not going to let them kill one goat and then raise it. Right? He's not going to do that. He's not going to raise an animal to do that. But the best approximation to a life and a death, to a death and a resurrection, the best approximation to that was to have two goats. And they actually laid their hands on both of them. So the, the hands were laid upon the, the goat that would go out into the desert too. And what's the doctrinal import of that? If you think about 1 Corinthians 15, if the dead rise not, you are yet in your sins. So it didn't say because you understand the resurrection incorrectly, your sins are still good because Jesus died and took away your sins. And there's something about the red. There's, a, there's a distinct way in which our sins being forgiven is associated with the resurrection, just like the sins being taken away on the head of that goat that lived. Gives us a little flavor, a little bit more color on our sketch now as to the way that God was going to save. That there's the power in the resurrection. If God was a very technical God, when the Lord died, he was a mortal man, he should die, and that's it. We'll just leave him there. But his desire to forgive, his mercy, and his righteousness couldn't let him be there. It says it wasn't possible that the grave could hold him. Well, it was if he was a very technical God, if he was a very judgmental God, because he'd say, well, he was mortal, so that's why he died. He had the same flesh as us. It, it tended toward death. He had urges like we do. Yeah, he put them all to death, but that's what it deserved. And he would be there still in the grave if he was a technical God. But he's a God who's abundant in mercy. And so he brings him out of the death of the grave. And in 1 Corinthians 15, it specifically attributes the resurrectional component of that to the forgiveness of sins. Not just that he agreed that flesh should be put to death, but that, and because of that, I will put you to life. 
that component is the escape goat that, that was taken our sins out and taken them away. So it's really interesting that God gives a little flavor of his means of salvation just in these little things in the Old Testament. I don't know how much they understood. They weren't doing a great deal in the wilderness other than wandering around, and they moved approximately on average once a year. Perhaps they had you know, people with Holy Spirit gifts who could talk to them about these, what these mean, and they would understand that perhaps. Uh, you won't find that kind of understanding in, in, the, in the churches around us. You won't find that level of detail probably that it's down to that. In Leviticus 4 verse 3, uh, it talks about the sin offering. And interestingly, the word for sin offering is just the word for sin. So you bring your sin offering before the Lord. Interesting that you bring your sin before the... So it is now not just a representation, but in the Hebrew, it's the actual thing. You, you bring your... This is your sin. It's not like our sins are tangible things that we can count and that we can look at, and the, they have like a body and stuff. But the Father does speak of them to us in that way, not because he needs help understanding them like that. We need help understanding them like that so that we can understand they're gone. These tangible things are gone when they're forgiven. So you bring your, off your sin, and then your sin is, is killed, and it's gone, which is only of help to us. Uh, Jeremiah 34 is an intriguing set of verses in verse 18 and 19. Jeremiah 34. Again, a little sliver of an understanding in the Old Testament that helps us to get to the New Testament and say, oh yeah, that makes total sense that the Father is working with the Lord, Jesus, to have a representative sacrifice. Jeremiah 34, verse 18. And I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they had made before me, when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts thereof, the princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, all the people of the land which passed between the parts of the calf, I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life. And their dead bodies shall be for meat to the fowls of the heaven and to the beasts of the earth. What this gives us as a little insight as to what it meant to have this covenant, this this sacrifice that it embodied an agreement, a, a promise. In Acts, it talks about them cutting a covenant, I think, in the, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles. So what did it mean to cut a covenant? Well, it's really interesting, isn't it? They cut it in half, and they passed between the midst of it. Why would you do that? Why would you cut an animal in half and walk between it? And how did that represent a covenant? It seems that like this is another way in which they would approximate that the offerer and the offering were one and the same. That they are showing a little flavor of a representative sacrifice by being in the middle of that animal. And they all, it looks like they like, had troop, everyone trooped through between this thing to identify with that offering and say that the, this is our promise, this is our covenant, we are part of this sacrifice. And it's very helpful language. Unfortunately, they didn't do it. I mean, the, the criticism is here that they had done this cutting of a covenant, but they hadn't lived up to it. It was just a piece of meat. It didn't go beyond that. They'd all trooped through and didn't think anything of it. And that could happen if you repeatedly offer the same offering. It can happen to us as we repeatedly break bread, drink wine. We get inured to it, and it doesn't touch us the same as perhaps it has in the past. And God's not interested in meat, is he? So he? He tells, through Samuel, he tells that to Saul. It's like, I didn't really want you to disobey me so you could give me some more meat. God doesn't want pieces of meat. He wants what it stands for. He wants you to be a willing offerer. You have to use the tool that you've been given for its sake. It is a teaching tool, so use it for that. And again, what we find here in Jeremiah, this, this uh, really interesting little passage, is the participatory nature of the offering. So the animal itself, 
you know, that they, the calf that they passed between, it didn't, it didn't represent very well. It didn't represent at all in many ways. But there was some insight, some little flavor of that. So the skin was worn. Okay, that helps me to understand I, I'm part of it. Your hands are on the head as this animal dies. Now, did you just put your hands on your head and walk away? Maybe there's an inference that you kept your hands on its head as it's dying. So you were really associated with it. They offered animal sacrifices all the time. Perhaps they didn't think anything of that. But for those of us who've maybe killed just a few times, then you're like, okay, this really kind of jolts me a little bit. The sin itself was brought to God. Not just the sin offering, but the sin itself. Uh, they cut a covenant and passed through the pieces thereof. The Passover lamb is another one. Did I put that on there or not? No, I didn't. But you could think of the Passover lamb as another one. What did God do to help them to understand that this wasn't an instead of sacrifice? How long did that lamb have to live with them in their household for? Right? So he lived with them for those days in the household so that it hurt a little bit, so that it was part of them. It was in their household. And so you ask, okay, well, that was, you know, what was the, well, the reason has to be that it was part of them, that they were associated with it. They participated with that. And they're cute, these little lambs, aren't they? Anyone keep lambs or goats? Funny. My goats are hilarious. They are so naughty. (laughs) They're just like my wife. It's funny. (laughs) If you go out, it's funny. They got out. They're like, they're different, different breeds of goat. And mine are, has anyone heard of a Houdini goat? It's like, that's what I've got. Well, it used to have the dead now, sadly. <laughs> but uh, they could get out from anything. And, and if, if you tried to let them out, they wouldn't go out. <laughs> That's what goats do. So I, would go, I remember one time they escaped from the, the property and they went down to the neighbors and started chewing on their things. Just, they were the same things. They were just in their yard. <laughs> it was so, so funny. And my neighbor told me, so I came over to them. And they could tell by like, the way you approached them what you wanted them to do. And so they looked at me, and I was walking towards them like I wanted to get them, and they were a little bit on edge, and then I realized, ah, I need to psych out these goats. So I just walked past them and just nonchalantly <laughs> just grabbed, grabbed something they liked eating and then just walked back to my yard, and they were like, <laughs> like this. <laughs> it's like, yeah, the best way to get them out was pretend you were trying to get them in. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, they, they're cute little things, um, and they have a little personalities. Even chickens. I, I love my chickens, too. There's a little cuteness and personality. If you have to live with it for five days, then you sort of see a little bit of that character coming out. And so when you sacrifice it, it, it touches you, hopefully, a, a little more. Let's have a look at the language um, on here. So with the teenagers, we do, in the past at least, I've done skits on these. So we've, we've play out, played out these different pictures of redemption as one brother calls them. Very long words on the left, aren't they? Far too many syllables to be used all the time. And yet each one of them speaks of a little picture of something. So sometimes they're called word pictures. The one we've looked at already is atonement or at one month, and it means that we're naked and then we're covered. So it conjures up a vision, and we like those things that conjure up visions. It's helpful. Uh, One that we could look up right now is the redemption. Now, I guess we're not too far from places where you literally had slaves being sold not too long ago, and where the Civil War like, is in this area, isn't it? You see uh, little reminders of that. So it's remarkable. You literally would have people sold. And the idea of redemption, the word picture that that sums up, is that we are slaves, and we're bought out of slavery under the law in the land of Israel, if you got so poor, you could actually auction yourself off. But then if your cousin or uncle had enough money, he could buy you out of slavery. And so we see ourselves as the, the slaves, and a price has been paid. Any one of these things taken to an extreme, it's like a parable, can become unhelpful. But it's almost like here's, here's the whole package, and you can grab a piece of it and put it back, and you see something of the work of the Lord. And so we see ourselves as slaves. A price, a heavy price, has been paid for us. In the scriptures, often the redemption price is paid in silver. But we also hear that we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. 
So a high price has been paid, and it's helpful for us to realize that we have been bought out of slavery. Let's have a look, if we can, to Daniel chapter 9 and see somebody for whom this made a lot of sense, somebody who understood what it was to be atoned for and redeemed, somebody who has been taken as a young man. Daniel's taken as a young man, and you could easily imagine that he could feel isolated, abused, uh, and he could fall back on blame and shame. He could fall back on fig leaf religion. He could decide that he wasn't going to live according to the life of God. He was going to live according to where he was. Look at what God's abandoned me. Look what they did to me. They've they've taken my body and, and ruined it. And yet what we find is a beautiful characteristic of God portrayed in this lovely man's life. So Daniel chapter 9, have a look from verse 5 at the helpful language. Remember we looked at the helpful language, I am crucified with Christ. Helpful language that Daniel portrays in his speech. So think about my speech and your speech as to how often we use these pronouns when somebody in our ecclesia has gone off the deep end. We, verse 5, have sinned and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly. Daniel hadn't done. He was only a teenager, probably, when he left Israel. How was he involved in the vile worship that he'd left? But he says, we. Verse 6, neither have we hearkened unto your servants, the prophets, which spake in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Well, Daniel had listened. He had separated himself. He determined in his heart that he wasn't going to be polluted. Verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but unto us, confusion of faces. Look at the pronouns he chooses. They indicate his understanding of an atonement, of a covering. And look what he does in verse 7. He declares the righteousness of God. Verse 8, O Lord, to us belong confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers. We have sinned. Verse 9, at the end of it, we have rebelled. Verse 10, we obeyed the voice, neither have we obeyed the voice, uh, further on in verse 10, which he set before us. And you can go through and you can see the us, our, we, my, n- n- not my and mine, but we and our and us. That shows you the natural outworking of this man's grasp of the work and the character of God. He didn't have the shame, blame things going on. He had a positive example for others to look at as the salvation principles in action. And we've thought about those participatory language that that is used, which is helpful. Another example, if you like, is uh, Rahab and Achan. Interesting. If you go back to Rahab and Achan, you think about an atonement, a covering. And what we have, sometimes it's nice to look at the reverse side of a coin to understand a little bit more about the coin. So you've got two sides of the coin here. So it's sometimes helpful to look at what does atonement not look like? (laughs) It didn't look like fig leaves. It didn't look like fruit and veg. And in Achan, a covering didn't look like this. And so we have an intriguing thing here that, as God often does, he likes to turn things on their head. In Rahab and Achan, you have these two sides of the coin, an an example which is good for us to look at and an example which is bad. You have an Israelite who wants a Babylonish garment, He wants a covering, and you have a Gentile who's actually got a true covering. Now, what tribe was Achan from? Right, so you've got the Gentile harlot and the Jewish of the tribe of Judah guy. I mean, which one do you think, God's got to go for that guy, surely? Uh, And she spiritually outperforms the prince of Judah. It's an amazing thing. Now, where were the spies hidden when they got to, uh, to the harlot's house? It's a peculiar thing. It's hard to explain to the teenagers yet. So they went on holiday, uh, and they, yeah, well. But where were they hidden? Stocks flax. Flax, right? So where was the flax? On the roof. What does flax make? Linen. Right, and why would you put linen on the roof? To dry? To blanch it, to to bleach it, yeah. And so what would she end up with after a full summer in the sun? White linen. 
never come across that again, do we? It's interesting. It's, you know, of course we come across it. The white linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, I, I went to a flax and a linen museum, a textile museum in the north of England years ago, and it was really interesting to read through the different parts of, of how you get flax to become linen. That whole process. Now, does anyone, do you guys know what flax is? Have you ever seen it? Does anyone grow it? So it's, it's subsoil. So the bit that you want is beneath the soil, which already is starting to speak to us, right? It's like Adam, it's in the soil. And you pull it out, and it's dirty, and it's stinky, and the outside bits are discarded, just like us. And then you have to put it in water, like baptism, and leave it there, and the outer portions, again, rot off. And then once you're done with that, you're still not done. You have to process it by continuing. There's all these different words like retting I've never heard of before uh, that are used on the process of that. And at the end of all that, you come out with a dirty-ish looking white. And what in the museum it says is only the wealthy are able to tie up their capital for a whole summer to bleach the flax from gray to white. Isn't that interesting? So the the work of the sun, like the sun of righteousness, if you like, the work of the sun on the flax turns it, after all the work, after the, essentially the baptism, after being drawn out from the, the, the earth, after the outer portion has been removed, and heavily polluted, actually, after they've let it be in the water, it's, it's nasty. And then you still have to let it be in the presence of the, the sun of righteousness, if you, if you like, to turn from gray to white. It's really fascinating. So here's this woman who's a harlot, who, in spiritual terms is laying up for herself treasure in heaven. So she's in investing now for a future hope of something better. And, and like it said in the, the museum, only the wealthiest people could tie up their capital for that long. So people who couldn't would wear the grayish flax uh, turned to linen. And those who had white righteousness, there's some, there's some work that's needed on this. So it's really interesting. So she laid up the flax to bleach, um, just like she was laying up treasure in heaven. Uh, and it's an example for us, isn't it? The foregoing lusts and treasure of this world for a future hope. She esteemed in her spiritual way, she esteemed the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasures of, in her case, not Egypt, but the treasures of Canaan. Uh, and another visual application of the salvation language, the spies were hidden in the flax. This is interesting. They were inside there. So they hid, if you like, they put on flax. They put on righteousness, if you like. Colossians 3, 3, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. It's lovely language. Remember the participatory language? It's not he did it instead of you at all. There's nothing of that. You are hid in Christ, with, with Christ in God. So it's all inclusive. It's a lovely way of conjuring up that vision. And, and Achan, of course, demonstrated his view, I would say, I'd suggest to you, of the atonement by his actions. He snatched up an easy covering... Right? Instead of laying up these things on his roof and all the work associated with that for an extended period of time, he just snatched up what looked like a fine covering. It's almost like a fig leaf covering, but it probably looked really nice, probably felt good. Uh, it was appealing, probably. It was a Babylonish garment, so it come from some way. Maybe it had a particular look to it. Uh, it's probably comfortable cloth. And back then, you imagine, it wasn't going to be $2.50 or something for cloth. It takes ages to build it. Uh, and it was, this, here's the thing, it was convenient. It was convenient. That's a really bad word. And perhaps it had something to do with pageantry, too, that this, this Babylonish garment maybe spoke of something else. And it's quite interesting that my father-in-law used to be Catholic and, and my mother-in-law. My father-in-law talked to me about how all of the senses were involved in the worship. You'd go in and it would be dark and you'd see the candles flickering. And then you'd, you'd have the incense coming around. And then you'd have these beautiful architectural and uh, artistic things in the church, the chants of the choir. All the senses, like all of them were checked. It's almost like they had something like this. Make sure we get every single checkbox for every single portion of your senses. And it's the opposite to, to what God's looking for, not to rely on the senses. Not that we can't use our senses for God's purpose, but it's the opposite. It's an appearance worship. Um, now, Rahab's selfless behavior demonstrated her grasp of the true doctrine. She shunned the lusts and pleasures of Jericho and gave her allegiance to God. And we got this amazing declaration of her understanding. How did she understand after 40 years that this is the people who did this, that, and the other? 
and she was clothed upon with Christ. She had a true atonement. Now, who did she marry? She married a fish? Salmon? Yeah, yeah, salmon. And, yeah. So if you look in, I think we did yesterday, right? Uh, we looked at uh, Matthew chapter 1, and she married another prince of Judah whose name was Salmon or Salmon, and I understand that that means clothing. Isn't that interesting? And he's in, the, and she's in the lineage of Christ. So how fascinating that a woman who was working so hard to have a covering on her rooftop married into the line of Christ and married somebody called clothing. I think that's absolutely lovely. It's some, somewhat like Ruth, isn't it? That Ruth, when she went to Boaz, he covered her another one that's a little bit difficult to explain to teenagers. <laughs> she came to his, into his room at night and he put his covering over. But, but in the language we're looking at, it's, it's, it's an intriguing thing that this, the, the covering is what was necessary, an atonement. Another way uh, which is interesting to look at is the flip side. Of course, we looked at Achan. What about Moses when he came down from the mount? Moses, what did he do to the people after he found that they were worshipping the calf. I love, I love Aaron. Like, well, we threw in the gold, and then this calf came out. It's like, and he's the big brother. It's like, uh, really? But what did Moses do to them? He made them, yeah, he strawed the, yeah, made them drink it. So I guess he made them participate in their sacrifice, which is a good, good point. Well, what he did was he made them naked. So he unclothed them. He was demonstrating to them that they were unatoned for interesting, isn't it, that this idea of clothing is associated with it. Just, we haven't got too much time here, so last couple minutes, just think about uh, David and how he demonstrated his grasp of the doctrine of salvation. He saw himself and the people as one. Oftentimes, people will try and say, well, what did Jesus have to gain from his sacrifice, or, you know, what about him? And I understand it, because there is an element of that we need to explore, I would suggest you look at the top verse on the right-hand side of your little bookmark. One of the tests, perhaps, you could use to see if something is a good avenue is to go to these two verses. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So you, ask, you can ask that question. Of course, you can ask that question. How did the Lord benefit from his own sacrifice? You can ask it. But it needs to come back to this. Jesus benefited, and we can explore why. He definitely needed to not be dying. He had urges, don't call me good. He had the same sinful urges as we do, and yet he shunned them all. Uh, But the point was that he came into the world to save sinners. And what we don't like is that bright light on us showing how naked we are. And I'd rather say, well, yeah, okay, okay, but what about him? Remind you of Adam? You know, It wasn't me that did it technically. It was my flesh made me do it. It wasn't me that did it. The devil made me do it. And so we can say, you know, it was my, my sinful urges that, that needed that, that needed atonement. But the problem is that the, the uncomfortable part of it is, it's me. I sinned with what I was given. And, I, and it's shameful. And until we accept that, you know, we're going to go down the wrong way. But David saw himself and the people as one, just like Jesus did. There's always, the scriptures are always telling us that the emphasis of scriptures is all as one. So David associated with the outcasts, they came to him. And Jew and Gentile together were shown the beauty of holiness. He praised the Lord with them. He laid up, when he couldn't participate in building a temple, which is what he wanted to do, what did he do? God said, you're not going to build it. So he went, oh, he didn't. He understood the way God saved. So he participated by laying up all the things he thought his son could use. That's the mindset, isn't it? That's what we want. He gave a heritage to Solomon of all the silver and gold and everything that he would need to build it. So if he couldn't help one way, he'd help another. We've got the legacy of the Psalms, the instruments, singing. When we sing together, uh, it's just beautiful. That Brother Aaron's so talented to be able to bring the, the whole chorus together. And it's a weird thing that you can read a Psalm, you can read a hymn, and you know, that's fine. And then you sing it, and there's something about that which really gets you. And then you sing it with others who understand, and all of a sudden you've got this beautiful portrayal in part of the understanding of the atonement that we all as one. 
And under, another interesting thing with David which we can think of is his uh, military rules. Remember that when they came down and there was half of the army or a third of the army were exhausted and they stayed and guarded the stuff, when they decided to split the spoil, David said to them, you can't just split the spoil amongst those who were the combatants. The non-combatants who guarded the stuff are to have equality with everybody else. So this is the mindset of David that went through his life. So you could say his understanding of the atonement, his understanding of the salvation principles worked out in his life and it was declared. Uh, and with Daniel, you have all the we and ours and us. So I would suggest that we think and consider over the, the next little while how our use of pronouns and how our view of atonement can be expressed in our understanding of collective way of approaching life. Thank you.